by the Health Sciences Library System and the CFRL's Medical History Society. My name is John Merrill. I'm the History of Medicine Librarian at HSLS and the Secretary Treasurer for the CFRL's Medical History Society. So both my hats fit this particular lecture. Today's lecture is the second in a three-part special series of presentations based on a fascinating exhibit that the Health Science Library System was very fortunate to own it. Um, to get on loan from the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine. It is located on the second floor of this building, State Hall, down in um, Salk, down in the Hawk Library. Um, it's entitled, Life and Limb, The Toll of the American Civil War. And I strongly encourage those of you, it'll be here till October 26. I encourage those of you who have time after the session today, follow our associate director, and carry down to um, view this wonderful exhibit. It really is very powerful and very moving. The third and final presentation in this series will be 6 o'clock in the evening, not the morning, Tuesday, October 22nd, and we'll meet once again, not here, but up in 1105 Skate Hall. Our speaker that evening will be Professor Rory Cooper, distinguished professor and phase of paralyzed veterans of American Chair, Chairman, he is from the University of Pittsburgh, and he is an outstanding speaker and a very motivational individual. His talk is entitled, Advances in Prosthetic Devices, Engineering and Treatment, and obviously all of you and all of your friends and colleagues are welcome to attend this lecture. Students who are here earning extra credit, be they in my class, be they from the dental school, wherever, please see me immediately following the talk for me to sign your paperwork so you get your extra credit. Today, the Health Science Library System and the C.F. Reynolds Medical History Society are pleased to have as our speaker, Dr. Laura McLafferty. Dr. McLafferty earned her B.S. degree from Penn State University and then came here to earn her M.D. degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She is currently a fourth year senior resident in psychiatry right across the street at Western Psych Institute and Clinic where she is Chief Resident for Education. She has numerous scholarly publications and has received several major awards, including the C.F. Reynolds Medical History Society Award for the Best History of Medicine Research Paper. Today, she will address us about a different type of disability facing the soldiers, not only in the past, but also, regrettably, in our current scenario. Normally, when we think of disabilities, we think of lost limbs, we think of physical damage to the body, but there has been and remains a very powerful emotional and psychological aspect to wartime disabilities. And that needs to be addressed and will be addressed today. Dr. McLafferty's talk is entitled, Turning for Home, Nostalgia in American Military Psychiatry from the Civil War to World War II. Dr. McLafferty. Very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Erlen. Um, I apologize if my voice is a little hard to hear today. I'm just getting over a cold, but I will try my best. So, um, as Dr. Erlen mentioned, the, what my, the topic of my uh, talk today is nostalgia as a psychiatric diagnosis within the American military from the 19th into the 20th centuries. And the, the current era is a very interesting time for both psychiatry and particularly psychiatry within the military. Um, if you listen to the news at all in the last few years, you've probably heard about the um, increasing rate of suicides among <coughs> active combatants and recent veterans um, in all branches of the armed forces. You've probably heard about rising rates of PTSD and the ongoing debate about how do we diagnose PTSD, how do we help our veterans who are coming back with this particular problem. Um, and, and I think that it's actually starting to pose some even more basic questions, such as what types of trauma are our veterans and active combatants being exposed to, and how do we figure out who's at risk for emotional and psychological problems from being exposed to trauma, um, and, and really what effects are those issues going to have both um, for our veterans themselves but for the strength of our military as a whole. And 
to, to the beginner discussion of nostalgia, I think it's helpful to have that framework of asking questions about trauma because nostalgia at its core is really about the trauma of leaving, leaving one's home, leaving behind loved ones, leaving home itself and for uh, members of the military often having to delay or abandoning plans and often not having time to make alternate ones. So to, to, start, to, to start at the beginning, nostalgia as a term was first uh, coined in 1688 by a physician named Johannes Hulfer in Basel, Switzerland in his medical dissertation. This was not the first time that the concept of homesickness had appeared in medical literature, um, even as, re as it relates to uh, military and veterans. Um, the first time that it appeared was actually in texts from, from the ancient world, both Greece and Rome. But the term nostalgia, as we understand it, was first introduced in the late 17th century. It's derived from the Greek um, nosos, meaning return to the native land, and algos, meaning suffering or grief. And Dr. Hofer defined it as depressed mood due to overwhelming desire to return to both one's family and one's native land. I should note that he was a civilian psychiatrist writing about civilian patients, um, but he was certainly aware of descriptions of homesickness being written about soldiers. Um, uh, signs and symptoms related to this disorder that he noted included de depressed affect, increased hunger and thirst, and difficulty maintaining sleep. He included a couple of case studies in his dissertation to illustrate who he thought was most susceptible to developing nostalgia. His first case study was a student sent away from home for education, a young male um, sent away to do his undergraduate studies in another country, which was very common in continental Europe at the time. Um, this, in, the student he wrote about had a broken leg um, from which he didn't recover until he returned home and the nostalgia resolved. So he felt that young people being sent to foreign lands were susceptible. And then also those who lived an isolated life, particularly those who came from rural areas. And um, his case study for this, uh, for this uh, category was a young servant girl sent away, sent away from home to work as a maid, and she had difficulty performing her duties because she was so homesick. Um, as was very common for most medical authorities writing about um, nostalgia, there was a lot of nationalistic prejudice about who exactly developed nostalgia or who was most, um, uh, most susceptible to developing it. And for Hofer, he felt that um, a group called the Helvetians in France were particularly susceptible, as well as the Swiss. And then, he felt that nostalgia as a whole was a relatively benign condition with primarily psychological symptoms. But there were two really important aspects to it that could make it somewhat serious. It could complicate recovery from comorbid physical illness. In the case of his student case study, um, this, this student didn't recover from a broken leg until he had returned home and the nostalgia resolved. And then the only complete cure for nostalgia was to send the patient home. Other, other measures were, were usually only partially effective to help resolve the symptoms. And so nostalgia appears on and off in medical literature throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, um, primarily in the European literature. Um, but it certainly starts to show up more frequently in American medical literature with the uh, start of the Civil War. And the Civil War was uh, really a benchmark for um, military medicine in the U.S. Armed Forces because on June 18, 1861, the U.S. Sanitary Commission was created for the goal of promoting military strength for better hygienic measures and greater efficiency. And uh, one of the first gentlemen to head this organization was Dr. William A. Hammond, who was appointed Surgeon General on April 25th, 1862. And what's interesting about William Hammond in relation to nostalgia is that uh, Dr. Hammond's clinical practice was primarily in neurology. And at the time, psychiatry hadn't really formed itself as a distinct specialty, and it was still in its early stages. So, Neurologists often saw a number of psychiatric complaints as well. So Dr. Hammond um, certainly saw a fair number of psychiatric cases both um, in his military career and also in his civilian practice. 
Some other notable peers that he had were Dr. S. Warren Mitchell, again, uh, someone who primarily practiced neurology um, and treated nerve injuries at Turner's Lane Hospital in Philadelphia during the war, um, but was also famous for promoting the rest cure um, for treating psychiatric issues, particularly in women from the upper classes. The rest cure consisted of um, almost complete isolation and very little social stimulation, a very bland diet, and this could um, this this treatment was supposed to go on for months and was supposed to um, help a variety of nervous complaints. And then Dr. William W. Keene was another notable figure. He was the first brain, uh, excuse me, first neurosurgeon of the United States. And as I mentioned, these gentlemen, though they practiced neurology and neurosurgery, also encountered their fair share of psychiatric problems. This is a text that was written by Dr. Uh, Hammond after the war. It's called A Treatise on Insanity and, uh, and Its Medical Relations, and it was based on his treatment of psychiatric problems and in injured soldiers during the Civil War. And then, as I mentioned, Dr. Mitchell was famous for the rest cure which uh, was very interestingly explored in a novel called The Yellow Wallpaper uh, that was published um, in the late 19th century in which the protagonist actually slowly becomes psychotic um, as she undergoes the rest cure to treat her nervous complaint. So um, there is a volume called The Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion that was published after the Civil War ended by the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General, and it's really a treasure trove of, of um, you know, diagrams and descriptions of the various injuries that soldiers encounter, but it also gives um, really great figures as to um, the frequency with which certain uh, conditions appeared in, in soldiers within the Union Army. Unfortunately, an equivalent document does not exist for the Confederate uh, troops. But there is a section called Diseases of the Nervous System, and this includes both neurologic and psychiatric conditions. Um, and the most common diseases of the nervous system that were encountered by physicians and by union troops were headache and neuralgia. Um, I think headache is rather self-explanatory. Neuralgia um, referred to pain that did not have a specific point of origin, so um, unexplained pain. What's interesting is that nostalgia is actually one of the most common psychiatric diagnoses that was encountered during the Civil War. And it actually um, was diagnosed more frequently than the more general term insanity. So over 5,000 white Union troops and over 300 black Union troops were diagnosed with nostalgia at some point during the war. In terms of mortality, nostalgia was not necessarily fatal. Only um, less than 100 troops total were considered as having died from nostalgia, but um, the fact that it could be considered fatal in some cases does point to the seriousness with which it was considered by Civil War physicians. Now, when they described nostalgia in the medical literature, it was frequently called the weakling's disease. And this is a theme that you'll see come up very frequently when people write about nostalgia, is there's, almost, there's this moral component to a description of the disorder, as though the individuals who suffered from it um, were, were morally weaker than those who did not. It was a disease of men serving in the field, and um, there were four risk factors specific to Civil War soldiers that made them perhaps more susceptible to developing nostalgia. Um, one was the belief that the war would be a short duration. In the initial months after war was first declared, um, both sides thought the war would last less than a year, and that belief uh, dissipated rather quickly after the first battle of Bull Run. Um, but starting out believing that the war would be less than a year and then finding out that that wasn't going to be the case um, perhaps made them more likely to develop nostalgia. Also, um, whether whether volunteer or volunteer recruits are drafted, most of the military units were formed rather rapidly, and the men who joined had no real time to prepare for their absence or help their families do so. They were often drafted as they were preparing for harvest or actually harvesting crops, and, and that caused a problem. Also, too, as the war went on, um, there were fewer and fewer um, like professional military men, these um, people who were veterans of the Mexican-American War and other um, earlier conflicts who had adapted to the soldiers' way of life and had some liking for it. Um, most of the men who joined were not career military men and had short-lived enthusiasm for a rather difficult way 
Also, too, it was felt that uh, the initial voluntary recruits that were followed by huge numbers of men who were drafted um, perhaps led to an increasing rate of nostalgia because these men didn't necessarily want to be taken from their home. Also, too, for men who volunteered, it was felt that the bounty system um, to uh, generate recruits was problematic because you were essentially paying men large sums of cash initially to join the army, and it was thought that you were um, enticing them to join or enticing the wrong individuals to join for the wrong reasons. Other risk factors for nostalgia that were considered, again, this idea that someone being from a rural area was more likely to develop it. Um, one comparison that was made was uh, two regiments in the Excelsior Brigade of the Union Army. Um, the Excelsior Brigade was made up of regiments from New York, and they compared the 3rd Excelsior Regiment, which was from um, upstate rural New York, and they had more cases of nostalgia compared to the 4th Excelsior Regiment, um, who was from um, urban New York City and developed fewer cases. And this picture here is a monument to the Excelsior Brigade at, uh, at the Gettysburg National Historic Park. Um, again, certain nationalities were felt to be more likely to develop nostalgia, and the Swiss um, Laplanders and inhabitants of Savoy are a few um, groups that show up in the literature. And then comorbid physical illness, again, was likely to um, make someone more likely to develop nostalgia. Um, protective factors against developing nostalgia. Um, strong nationalistic feeling, which was noted more in the voluntary recruits versus the drafted men. And then also this idea of manliness, that if you were someone who um, had a more upright character were more manly, you were less likely to develop a disease that was considered to be a disease of the moral So common co-occurring symptoms um, that were observed with nostalgia were loss of appetite, and perhaps most importantly for the military as a whole, a general impairment of functions. These soldiers with nostalgia had trouble performing their duties. Um, it could really impact the ability of their unit to, um, to do what they needed to do. Potential cures, um, the best cure uh, was really sending the patient home, and there were a number of uh, soldiers who were discharged for psychiatric diagnoses, including uh, nostalgia, but that was a rather difficult task. Getting a psychiatric illness didn't, initial, didn't necessarily mean discharge. You had to be pretty um, severely impaired. Um, the other methods of uh, potential cure come back to this idea of um, promoting one's manliness, so sending someone into battle or ridiculing or reasoning from their peers. It was thought that if you subjected someone to enough peer pressure, you could reason in a nostalgia away. Um, what's really interesting about this moral component to nostalgia is that it shows a similarity to how it was perceived. Um, there's a similarity in how nostalgia and malingering were perceived by the medical community. They were both perceived as diseases of the mentally and morally weak. And two of the uh, notable figures we've talked about before, Dr. Mitchell and uh, Dr. Keene, who wrote both this text together as well as another text on malingering specifically, noted that um, both of these conditions were more pervasive in those who were uh, mentally or morally less fit. Frequently feigned symptoms um, related to malingering included lameness, spermatorrhea, back cases, pain, and paralysis. Um, but what's interesting to note is that mental illness and nostalgia were infrequently feigned because it was so hard to get a discharge after a psychiatric diagnosis. You were more likely to actually be sent to one of the various insane asylums around the country instead of getting a uh, discharge. So they share, they share a, a similarity in how they were perceived um, and who was thought to develop them, but nostalgia was not one of the frequently feigned And then um, because they were perceived to affect the same group of individuals, there were suggestions to, refer, to reform the furlough system to address both of these conditions. It was felt that the wound or illness-based furlough system in which you didn't get to go home unless you couldn't serve anymore because of a wound or illness encouraged malingering because you couldn't get home unless you looked sick. Um, it was also felt that if you tried a merit-based furlough system, you would, um, you would would motivate the men to um, act in the way they were supposed to as soldiers, make them more manly, more morally upright, and then also prevent nostalgia because perhaps they would go home more frequently because they were um, performing their duties as they were supposed to. So 
Nostalgia um, clearly had a significant presence within the Civil War, and it continued to have a significant presence within psychiatry as a whole um, into the early 20th century. And Ernst Kretschmer um, was one uh, prominent psychiatrist in Europe um, in the early 20th century, and he wrote about nostalgia, but he called it a homesickness reaction. And he felt that this was a response to an experience of physical isolation, removing someone from a physical place that was uh, dear to them for whatever reason. Um, he, he tended to focus on female adolescents who had left home to work as maids. And he felt that uh, homesickness reactions could have rather serious consequences for some individuals. He wrote about um, something called an extreme variant, a short circuit reaction, in which um, the patient was so overwhelmed by this desire to return home that the, uh, it, it overtook their normal cognitive processes and led them to um, commit extreme acts that were supposed to alleviate the circumstances that prevented them from returning home. And he included examples of maids committing arson or murdering their employer's children so that they could go back home. <clears throat> um, two other individuals who uh, wrote about nostalgia in their psychiatric di dictionary were Leland Hinsey and Jacob Shatsky, but they emphasize more the loss of connection to particular individuals as the primary cause of nostalgia. They also felt um, that although unusual, it could have serious effects, particularly resumption of quarrel relations, which means a return to childlike behavior. So these people who developed nostalgia were at risk for regressing and and losing all mature coping mechanisms and ability to form mature relationships with other adults. What's, what's really interesting, though, about nostalgia in early 20th century civilian psychiatry is that despite some authors like, like uh, Kretschmer and Hinsey and Shatsky writing about these potentially serious consequences of nostalgia is that there were some authors at the same time, some um, prominent psychiatrists, who make no mention of nostalgia at all. And one, uh, one individual who falls in that category is Eugene Buehler, who wrote a textbook of psychiatry that was first published in 1924, and he makes no mention of nostalgia. And this is um, actually something you see with some other um, prominent authors in textbooks as well. So clearly, while some are still paying attention to this as a separate psychiatric diagnosis, some individuals are, are making no mention of, uh, mention of it at all as other psychiatric diagnoses um, start to claim attention and prominence. Um, Dr. Bluer was famous for coining the terms autism and schizophrenia, which we of course still use today. So, Nostalgia does make an appearance um, in psychiatry, particularly military psychiatry within the world wars, but we'll start, we'll again see this nature of the changing perception of, of what nostalgia is and what um, potential consequences it has for soldiers. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, for, particularly for military psychiatrists, it was felt that there were three domains of mental function that could become diseased. This were, these were the intellectual, emotional, and volitional domains. And of course, the military's priority was, were really the intellectual and volitional domains because these were felt to most uh, strongly affect a soldier's ability to perform their duties and remain in the military. Uh, but as, as we'll realize as we talk about um, the experience of psychiatrists in World War I and II, they started to much more appreciate the influence that the emotional domain can have over these other areas. And the, the role of the psychiatrist in the military uh, was, was always a somewhat precarious one because they were serving two bodies. They were serving both their individual patients and soldiers, but they were also serving the military as a whole. And this is nicely illustrated in a quote from Colonel William C. Porter, who served in uh, the American Army during World War II. He said, the mission of the medical department is to make men fit for combat or for servicing combatant troops and failing that to remove casualties from the army. The psychiatrist has the problem of selecting individuals who are vocationally fit for service in the armed forces and having accepted him to assist him in preserving his mental integrity and failing in that to eliminate him from the service. So, not only did the military psychiatrist have a duty to his patients to you know, recognize and treat their conditions, 
but he also served two purposes in relation to the military as a whole. He was supposed to prevent conscription or recruitment of men who were mentally unfit to serve, and he was also supposed to help remove as rapidly as possible soldiers whose mental state rendered them unfit to serve. And in World War I, um, starting with the, the British, it became quite clear how important those roles were for um, military psychiatrists. In, in World War I, I think one can argue that the nature of warfare as we knew it had changed with the development of things like trench warfare and weapons like the machine gun. So soldiers were being exposed to types of trauma that had never been encountered before um, in battle. And starting early in the war, the term shell shock was coined to describe the soldiers' psychological reaction to the types of trauma they were experiencing. Um, some of the notable symptoms included um, inability to um, resume normal duties, um, almost like some of them almost acted like they were in stupor, they couldn't be aroused. Um, another cardinal symptom that's shown in this photo here, the soldier in the bottom left corner, is something called the thousand mile stare, where soldiers uh, were almost catatonic. They just sat very rigidly and stared into space and couldn't respond to anyone um, trying to uh, arouse them. But what's interesting is that although shell shock was initially coined to describe this um, reaction to trauma, it, it suddenly started to cover a variety of psychiatric diagnoses, and the number of soldiers getting diagnosed with shell shock skyrocketed within the British military. So much so that by the end of the war, the British military had over 20 hospitals dedicated to um, treating these individuals. Um, and because of because of the increasing numbers of men getting um, shell shock diagnoses and really impacting the military's uh, just um, manpower in terms of numbers, the concept of frontline uh, treatment was developed, which um, the goal of which was to treat the soldier as close as possible to his unit or the frontline proximity um, and treat him as quickly as possible um, after the <coughs> problem was recognized immediately and treat him with the expectation that he would then return to active duty. So proximity, immediacy, expectancy. So there was a shift from sending all of these soldiers home after diagnosis to be treated in hospitals on the home front to treating them in almost in the midst of battle and then sending them right back to active duty. The American experience after the Americans joined the war in 1917 wasn't a whole lot different. Um, and it actually necessitated the creation of the U.S. Army Division of Neurology and Psychiatry in March 1917. And by the end of the war, um, th and this is just after two years of war, there were 27 hospitals in the United States caring for 33,000 veterans with neuropsychiatric diseases. And the cost of care and discharge of the psychiatrically unfit soldier um, varied from $30,000 to $35,000. So the cost and burden of care of these soldiers who were experiencing psychological problems was, was astounding by the end of the war, um, both, for both the Americans and the British. So by the time World War II came around, um, there, was, there was increased focus on that first uh, role of the military psychiatrist that I mentioned, which was to prevent the inclusion or conscription of individuals who had already developed mental illness or who were at risk for developing it prior to service. So at the beginning of World War II, there was an increased focus on exclusion, not treatment of psychiatric disease. And there was a concerted effort to really screen soldiers prior to um, sending them into battle for different types of mental illness. And by the time the war ended, 20 million men had been examined and 1.6 million men had been rejected for psychiatric care. That's over five times the rate of rejection for psychiatric issues that was observed in World War I. So this was, this was a huge effort. Categories of disease that were targeted in the induction exam included mental defect or deficiency or intellectual disability in, in modern parlance, psychopathic personalities, major abnormalities of mood, psychoneurotic disorders, um, people at risk for psychosis or schizophrenia, chronic inebriety or substance use, uh, syphilis of the central nervous system uh, was still a, a big issue at the time. And then any ex existing disease of the brain, spinal cord, or peripheral nerve. So any type of neurologic injury or disorder. And there's a really nice set of data on one particular military base that was published in 1944. 
Um, the base is uh, Camp Landing in Florida, where two psychiatrists came on staff after March 15, 1941. And by the end of 1943, they had examined almost 17,000 individuals. And these two psychiatrists were responsible not just for these induction exams, but also um, treating any psychiatric disease in soldiers who were on the base. Because, of, because they had so many inductees to examine, um, their exams ran two to three minutes in length. Um, they rejected 283 individuals over the two years they were there for psychiatric causes. That was about 1.92% of all men conscripted from the military who showed up at the base. And then of all men rejected from, from military service from that base, 10% uh, were rejected for psychiatric reasons. So, Despite this huge effort to screen all these, um, all these conscripted men for psychiatric issues and, and all the attention paid to the process and the number of men that were excluded, it essentially didn't work. Um, by the end of the war, 438,000 soldiers were discharged from the American military due to psychiatric issues. And um, by 1943, the number of discharges due to psychiatric issues is actually greater than the number of new enlisted. So this was, um, they realized that exclusively focusing on trying to identify those at risk of developing mental illness and excluding them from the army wasn't the solution to the problem. So they returned to the frontline method of treatment of psychiatric illness, again, treating individuals close to the front line as soon as possible, trying to return them to active duty to um, retain manpower. Um, this was uh, reinstated in the Tunisian campaign of 1943 and uh, fully operational by the Italian campaign of the same year. So this was the general state of psychiatry in uh, World War I and II. And you'll probably notice that we didn't talk about nostalgia in World War I. And the reason for that is it simply wasn't mentioned. There was no mention of nostalgia in the medical literature. And there you know, could probably be a very similar <coughs> hypothesis about that. But um, my hypothesis is that there was such a focus on shell shock and um, so many psychiatric diagnoses were getting labeled as shell shock that that's perhaps is what happened um, to nostalgia as well as to a variety of other psychiatric issues that had previously been paid attention to. Nostalgia, interestingly though, makes a reappearance in World War II. Um, and some thought about this is that it was probably uh, partially due to concern for homesickness in soldiers that were serving in far-flung regions of the world, mainly the Pacific and the European theaters. And um, I found at least two papers that talk, uh, that describe, um, that are exclusively about nostalgia um, in, in the American military in this time period. And the first talks about the need for soldiers to have emotional emancipation that this was required for successful military service because it helped a soldier to adapt to his new style of life, adapt to his new location. And um, again, there's almost this moral component to the description. Uh, the soldier had to uh, be morally upright <coughs> and, and able to have a healthy attachment to home but be able to leave it behind as well. Um, risk factors for nostalgia, again, included extreme youth and being a native of a rural area. These were felt to um, decrease one's emotional emancipation. And then um, another concept related to um, nostalgia was this idea of home fixation, where a soldier would become so focused on home that his thoughts, he would focus his thoughts so exclusively on home and the loved ones he left behind that he would lose the ability to focus on his everyday uh, duties and, and what he needed to accomplish. The concern about home fixation or cryptic nostalgia was that even though it was relatively benign, it was easy to misdiagnose it as something like uh, schizophrenia, um, uh, mental retardation, something that was uh, more serious. Um, and the concern for this was that nostalgia was relatively benign and easily treated, so military discharge was unnecessary. Often you could send someone home for a short furlough, or again, it could be reasoned out by um, So, so we've followed nostalgia from its beginnings in the late 17th century where it's a separate psychiatric condition with its own symptoms that can have potentially serious consequences. And that conceptualization carried through the Civil War and even through the early 20th century in civilian psychiatry 
But by the time it shows up in World War II, it has actually become more of a benign condition, perhaps even um, more part of other uh, syndromes like anxiety or depression and not so much its own, um, its own diagnosis. And it didn't, it didn't require military discharge. So in civilian psychiatry, to summarize, it really, nostalgia went from being considered a separate psychiatric disease to more of a symptom of a, an adjustment disorder, something that um, anyone could feel on some level when they're separated from their, their place of origin or, or their loved ones. Um, for certain individuals, it can certainly reach problematic um, severity, but it's more a symptom of a larger disorder and not its own psychiatric disease. And then in the military, even more importantly, it went from being considered a separate diagnosis requiring discharge, so a diagnosis that could therefore affect the military's ability to retain its soldiers, to something that was more a risk factor for other disorders that did need to be recognized and treated, but that on its own was rather than not <coughs> not necessitate discharge, or did not severely, hopefully severely, impact the soldier's ability to perform his duties. So what what impact does, does this development um, of this particular diagnosis have for our current understanding of uh, psychiatric conditions in general, um, the, uh, the implications of trauma, and, and what does that mean for, for the military and for psychiatrists serving in the military? I think it has, um, it, it has implications because it helps us to understand the, um, the ways in which psychiatric conditions and things like exposure to trauma and leaving behind one's home have for the military's ability to retain their soldiers and for soldiers' ability to perform their duties and how military psychiatrists have to, have to serve both of those roles in addition to being, in addition to their primary role of treating their patients. And then we started this discussion by, um, by referencing the, the current uh, situation with post-traumatic stress disorder and the rising rates of that condition, the rising rates of suicides in the military. And I think that um, understanding the development of nostalgia as, uh, as first a separate diagnosis and then later on as more of a symptom, it has implications for our current understanding of PTSD because it helps us to understand the effects of taking soldiers from their homes and sending them into um, zones of combat trauma. It helps us to ask the question, who's at risk for developing psychiatric problems when exposed to trauma? And then in relation to nostalgia, it, the, the question is, what happens to soldiers' coping systems when they, leave, um, when they leave home and loved ones behind? We don't consider nostalgia its own diagnosis anymore, but we do know that taking someone out of their familiar environment, taking them away from their support systems, does affect them psychologically. So, so what, what is that doing to them and their ability to handle other stress? And then in terms of multiple deployments, what kind of stress is that placing on our soldiers? It's one thing to go um, into a theater of war for one tour of duty. It's another thing to send them there three or four times, which is happening quite often these days. And then um, what's interesting about the current military is that it's an all-volunteer military, whereas um, the military in the time of the Civil War um, World War II, Korean, and, and other in the Vietnam War, those were uh, those were conscripted armies. Those were made up of men who were drafted for military service. So, how are things different for an all-volunteer military? Is being a volunteer soldier place you at risk for different psychiatric conditions? And does it affect your risk for PTSD or for nostalgia in ways different than a conscripted individual? So, these are some of the broader questions I think that um, we have to ask ourselves when we. Um, think about psychological uh, conditions in soldiers and in the military and the effects that they have overall for our military strength and ability to perform. Um, and those questions were certainly asked in the Civil War and, and as we went on through the early 20th century. So, um, well, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Standing talk, loved Thank it. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. In the Civil War, there was nostalgia was listed as a cause of death. Yes. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Did they suicide? Did they just stop the game? How did they die? 
Unfortunately, for most of the psychiatric conditions that are listed in the medical and surgical board of the body, there's no accompanying description. Um, most of the descriptions contained within that, that, that work are relegated to uh, physical injuries, um, communicable diseases that were encountered. And there's just a lack of description for the for psychiatric thing, but I'd love to know that. But at least in, um, at least in earlier literature, um, death attributable <coughs> to nostalgia or to similar conditions is usually due to weakness, general lack of appetite, kind of a wasting away. included in literature about nostalgia historically were immigrant populations, um, particularly immigrant populations coming through Ellis Island. There's a lot of really nice data about rates of psychiatric conditions for them. And they, along with soldiers, were felt to be more developing nostalgia because of that removal from their place of life. Yes? Uh, I'm just curious, for those spread line treatments, yeah. what kind of specifically what kind of treatments are what used? Um, for the most part, it was brief psychotherapy. Um, initially, when they started treating shell shock, um, they, they, they had their understanding of shell shock and psychiatric response to trauma um, kind of went, underwent an interesting evolution. And at first, it was thought to be um, a condition, again, of morally weak individuals who needed some kind of way to um, get it shocked out of their system. So they had more brutal methods of treatment starting on things like electric shock, um, rather, rather gruesome methods. But as their understanding um, evolved and it became more of an acceptable condition to have and something that was so commonly seen, the methods of treatment became less brutal as well. So it was primarily things like just general support and psychotherapy. There were, there were essentially no psychotropic drugs at the time, so there was no medication. Yes? In the Civil War, do you think that nostalgia could have been brought about because even though they were fighting in their home country, the, the country that they knew was changing all around them, which uh, would lead to, like, if they didn't feel like they were at home anymore? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the Civil War chain transformed the, the entire nation and society in general. I think also, too, we, we take for granted nowadays um, what it's like to travel, because in the time, travel was much more difficult. You know, many places didn't have railroads yet. So you had a lot of men who often hadn't left the 10-mile radius around where they were born, suddenly, particularly within the Union, thrown into this new region, the South, where they've never, ever been before, and the way of life was so completely different, and, and that perhaps put them at risk as well. Yes? Did, continue on from what he asked, did they see any more psychiatric casualties among um, immigrant soldiers, so like the Irish that came over in large numbers? Um, unfortunately, there's no data on that. Um, most of the data, apart from the medical and surgical history of war and rebellion, were a case that he's and I haven't seen any case studies of, of immigrant soldiers. That's a good question. Yes? Just following up on this, <clears throat> I think you would have a different reaction because these Irish literally were met at the dock by recruiters. So they never had a chance to become, in quotes, American. They became American in the Union Army, fighting this foreign element. But in terms of them thinking themselves as Americans, they wanted to become Americans, but um, they had no time to adapt at all. It was incredibly brutal. 